just such a pleasure to be part of this truly inspiring event today. Bathed in prayer, we're brought together from far corners of the world because of our love for CMC Valor, for Ida Scudder, and for everything that she has inspired in us and others. And it's therefore my pleasure to introduce someone who really epitomizes those values. So Dr. Rahman, who we'll be hearing from today, really does epitomize leadership and a passion for raising up young people, a passion for women's health. Serving as a general practitioner in Perth, in Western Australia, she is someone of considerable renown. And she serves as a senior lecturer at the University of Notre Dame in the city of Fremantle. And in fact, in that city, she received recently the Aspire Award, which recognized her work on postnatal recovery. And this was at the World Organization of Family Doctors. In her role as a medical educator, she not only works at the University of Notre Dame, but also serves as deputy chair of the Royal Australia College of General Practitioners. So I and others are very much looking forward to hearing you, Dr. Raman, and thank you for all that you are doing. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone who has joined in this evening, both from United States as well as in Australia. Just before we sort of start off with the session, I wanted to throw a couple of questions around. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. My, my name is Ramya, and it's, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I grew up in Orange in New South Wales, so that's um, on the east coast of, of Australia, a small, a small country town. I'm a second generation Australian, so my heritage is Indian, and um, my parents migrated here to Australia when I was about eight. So I moved to Perth in, in the west coast of Australia, so um, for medical school, so coming up to about nearly 12 years ago now, and um, I started my, my medical school here at the University of Notre Dame in Fremantle, so um, quite naive to the big city, but certainly has um, taken off on a good tone and enjoy the warm weather here in Perth, particularly during the summer months. So just before we sort of start off, I'd um, like to make this as interactive as I possibly can. And Meredith, I'm going to really draw on your um, um, on your help with this as well. So I'd like everyone to take about a minute or so and think about leaders that you admire. Um, and they could be leaders of social justice, leaders that you really look up to. They could be colleagues that you're working with um, and leaders of thought or people who have really shown some courage and change. Um, if you could throw some names out into the chat box, I'll time it for about a minute and then um, uh, Meredith, if you would be happy enough to share those names with me, that would be great. Yeah, we have actually a nice collection. As a matter of Wonderful. fact, I'll start, I'll start going. So yes. we have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Francis Meany, Dr. Florence Pert, Ida Scudder has actually made it a few times on the list, <laughs> um, Michelle Obama, Madeleine Albright, and then we have Gandhiji, and there might be more to that. And then we've got Abraham Lincoln, Nelson Mandela, Thomas Merton, and another vote for Lincoln, and the late Mrs. Alice Ganamutha, the nursing superintendent of CMCH. And we've got George Washington. So unless we hear another, that's a, an impression. Oh, and Mother Teresa. And wonderful another list. Vote, another vote for Gandhi and another vote for Mother Teresa. Thank you, everyone. One, wonderful. While we have that sort of rolling, I'm going to throw out that second question there as well, because that is an absolutely fabulous list. And there are some very, very wonderful leaders that are very close to my heart on that list on there as well. Now, given that we've got a list over there, what are some of the ways in which that you feel you are like these leaders? What are some of these characteristics that have really inspired you? Okay, so I think it's about a minute. So Meredith, I might just get you to maybe just shout out some names for or features for me. Yes, gladly. So we have a, a great list here. And so courageous, authentic, community building, integrity, inspiring, hopeful, humility. Embrace adversity and find opportunity in it. Humility, compassion, leading from the front, service, humility, character, commitment to the call, passionate, loving God and loving God's people, grounded, courageous, honesty, integrity, honesty, and courage, 
a commitment to nonviolence, humility, justice, courage, servant leader. What an absolutely stunning list. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing those, Merida. Thank you. And the reason that I, I, I was throwing these questions out initially is because these are the characteristics of leadership. These are the characteristics that we admire and most importantly, that really inspire us inspire us to who we would like to be, inspire us to the characteristics that we would really like to do. So it's not really defining about what leadership is. Everything that you have mentioned is what leadership is. And these are the people who have really drawn us to um, the sort of values that we potentially hold in our day-to-day -day life, as well as in our principles in the way that we carry out our work. On that note, I'd like to share a personal story I'd like to share my personal story to give you a little bit of an idea about my association with Dr. Ida Scudder and also the CMC and the people who have played quite a significant role in my life and an influential aspect that they continue to have. As I had mentioned, I'm a second generation Australian of Indian heritage um, and I grew up in the country in New South Wales. When my parents first moved to Australia, we, uh, we stayed in Sydney for a grand total of about 10 days, after which time we promptly moved over to the country. And initially we ended up in a place called Dubbo, and after which time my dad is an academic, so he um, got, a, got a position at the University or University of Sydney, the Orange Campus, which is the country area in, in the east coast of Australia. So I say that because um, City life in Australia was um, not something that I was terribly used to. So country life is what I really have, um, was much more used to when I was a child. My primary school and high school were probably the most testing times for me, as you can imagine, someone who has moved from India over to a um, foreign, foreign country. Certainly I've had the um, privilege of uh, traveling prior to that as my dad being an academic, we did travel to other parts of the world, but certainly coming to live in another country was a new experience. This was probably in the 1990s, um, sort of early, sort of mid 1990s, I should say, when I learned very quickly what it means to be different, what it meant for me to be very different as well. I was different because of my color, I was different because of my accent. I was probably even different because of the way my mum dressed when she used to drop me off to school. My mum's listening. I'm pretty sure she would have uh, sparked up an eyebrow when I said that to her. But the reality is um, we are very different culturally. And those are the associations that we tend to address when um, we identify ourselves with a particular community. As we all know, Eastern culture and values are quite different to Western culture. Nothing is right or wrong. It's just the variation in it. But I don't think I had the maturity to really understand that very well at that time. Ultimately, all of this plays a huge role in who we are today. And it certainly has played a role in who I am today. And it has shaped me to become who I am today. School was very testing because it took me many years to actually fit into school, particularly in high school, going into primary and high school. And my self-confidence was rather very quite rock bottom at that period of time. I worked through many cultural challenges that I had to get through and I learned the skill of patience, acceptance and resilience. They certainly didn't come easy to me, but my parents have played a huge role in shaping those characteristics in me and I'm very proud to do so. And I openly acknowledge that at every opportunity that I possibly can. It was in year nine and the single subject, believe it or not, that I was really good at was biology, top the class every time. But the one class that I was terribly bad at is mathematics and my husband still pulls me up on it because I'm still quite bad at it. <laughs> so it was at this time when I decided, well, medicine, that sounds like a fun career. It would be a fun thing to do. And I mentioned it to one of my teachers. It was actually my mathematics teacher. And I said to him, well, you know, I'm thinking about doing medicine. And at this point, he said to me, Rami, I'm not really sure that you're terribly a good fit for this. I think you should try something a little bit much easier, something that would match your IQ a little bit better. Now, that was a bit of a crunch. And wow, was that a kick in the guts at that point in time? But me being me, I was um, sort of moping around at home quite a lot when I got there. Um, and eventually, mum and dad continued to sort of you know, prod at me and my dad sat me down and he said, listen, what's the matter with you? You know, it doesn't really matter what people have to say or, you know, dip, you know, don't have to be a judge of what you can be capable of. 
And he handed me this book. This, as you can see, is the um, biography of Dr. Ida Scudder. Now, when he handed me this book, I was a teenager. And as you can imagine with any teenager, I promptly put it aside and carried on with my other moping around activities that I did. So that's where it sort of sat. But a few months later, I opened that book and actually read it. And am I very thankful that I read that because it has changed my thinking. It changed the way that I actually perceived things as well. My perception of self-confidence, my perception of the thoughts of leadership and my perception of having to achieve what you can achieve if you put your mind to it was the inspirational factor that I took away from reading this book. And Dr. Ida Scudder's story still stands very high at me and the fact that I am, I've been invited here to speak tonight is an absolute huge honor. I never ever imagined this sort of a scenario to eventuate. So Dr. Ida Sophia Scudder, the founder of the Christian Medical College and, Velo of College and Hospital of Velo in India, as a third generation American medical missionary in India, in the late 1890s, she witnessed the death of three women during childbirth due to customs and culture. Even though her father was a doctor, the people and particularly the husbands of these women who were who were pregnant and ready for delivery, denied that they didn't want a man delivering the, their, their children. They were at no point accepting of medical help from male doctors at that point. And hence she witnessed the death of these three women during childbirth. She realized at that point in time that women are needed for women in medicine. This was her determination to enter medicine at that point. And as you all know, she was one of the first women graduates of Whale Medical College of the Cornell University in New York. She then returned to Velour, where she opened a one blade clinic in the 1900s. And most importantly, she opened a medical school for women in India. Today, as you all know, Velour Medical College is a very world pioneering college servicing in teaching and research. Dr. Scudder's story is an inspiration to me. She lived in an era when women's activist groups were fighting for equality. The right to vote for women was being questioned at that point in time. She exemplified leadership skills, everything that we probably mentioned in that initial activity and role model to women to actually own their respect. I've been to Velour. I went to Velour with my dad when I was in year 10 with my mind set to being doing medicine despite the fact that I was bad in mathematics. It was a passion. It was a passion. It was the experiences and the role models that really shape who we are today. So where are we today? Women in medical leadership. Today, we're in 2021. Are we facing equality in this world, particularly for women and women in medicine is a good question. In Australia, particularly, I could speak to say that for many decades, women have attained gender parity in gaining admission to medical school. But there is still continues to be an underrepresentation of women in senior leadership positions, which still persists in Australia and throughout the world. In, in Australia, around 30% of deans, chief medical officers or medical college board committee members are women, 30% while women only make up about 12.5% of CEOs in large hospitals. In February 2019, and some of you may have seen this, the Lancet decided an entire issue on advancing women in science, medicine and global health to highlight the current issues on hand. These disparities are even greater for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, women of colour and women with disabilities, which it's a bit of a shame to say, but it still prevails in today's world. We have made progress in equality. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but what I am suggesting is we need greater efforts to be made to progress this even further than the statistics that I've just provided. Unconscious gender bias contributes to the glass ceiling or the unspoken barriers to career progression. This prevails even today, despite increased and equal qualifications, employability and work performance among women. And I'm specifically talking about women in medicine. I'm sure many of you have heard of this term, token women on boards and committees. I certainly have. I've probably been a token woman. Um, 
unfortunately, in certain situations, not knowingly. But it brings us the question about what is diversity? Diversity is a, tame that, is a term that's gained quite a bit of traction in the recent times. And sometimes this is the connection that we need to be able to make. What do we exactly mean by diversity? It's about empowering people by respecting and appreciating what makes them different. Does it, it could be in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, education, or national origin. Every individual who steps into an organization brings with them a diverse set of perspectives, work and life experiences, as well as religious and cultural differences. That is what diversity actually means. Now, workforce, including senior medical positions, includes a mix of genders, races, and other types of diverse candidates. But as we go up the leadership ladder, as we progress into the exec committee levels, it tends to become increasingly homogenous. The concept of diversity, it becomes less and less. Many European countries have imposed gender quotas for at least 40% of a company's board being women. New Zealand and Australia have imposed, imposed disclosure requirements for gender diversity on company boards. But if there are such impositions on certain boards, don't you think the trouble with all of this is the box ticking activity that tends to happen? We need to have women on boards because we need to meet our 40% criteria, or we need to actually show these numbers. This is what is meant by the token appointment. Token appointments are often sometimes troublesome for a couple of reasons. Number one, they undermine the idea that bringing equality to corporate boards is unsuitable or unqualified women are appointed as directors. Tokenistic appointments of underqualified women reinforces that there are not enough qualified women in the workforce, which is not true. The second reason is token appointments on corporate boards undermine the benefit of the diversity of governance. Gender, race, age, experience, and other forms of diversity bring various perspectives, allowing better informed board decisions. Now, you may ask me, I'm, I'm producing statistics, I'm talking some numbers, I'm making some very generalized statements. I will share a story where I have personally experienced this. I hold leadership positions today, sitting on committees and boards at postgraduate education levels. But the concept of unconscious gender bias was highlighted to me when I walked into a meeting, it was an exec level board meeting, and someone who was sitting next to me, a gentleman, he leaned over to me as I sat down and he said to me, you must have got here today to meet the gender quota. I'm just going to leave that thought there. I was disappointed that someone could think that I was there by sheer luck and maybe not because of my capability. So what are some of the barriers that we see in medical leadership? I'm no expert on this, but I, I am going to quote someone who is an expert. Professor Helena Teed is the executive director of Monash Partners Academic Health and is also at the Monash University in Melbourne. She defines gender equity has moved from a battle between genders and deliberate exclusion of women from leadership to a recognition that there is a need for all to actively champion change, irrespective of gender, including addressing barriers to progress. She categorizes the barriers to medical leadership in women into three categories. The three categories that she defines them are capability, capacity, and credibility. So what do we mean by that? These days, it's not about women not being able to get into these positions, but it's about helping women and enabling women to be able to sustain in these positions. And that's really important. Having that understanding as men and women in that situation is, is the key feature to it. So capacity. There are limitations for women to additional household and parenting duties which disproportionately shoulder women in their day-to-day -day activities. The Australian medical workforce data shows women work equal hours initially and then have a sharp decline in because of maternity leave and early preschool years when their kids go to school. And then they rise to similar hours as men. 
we need to be able to empower and support women to seek flexible and equitable balance outside of work as well as for parenting. So that's capacity, enabling capacity for women to be able to work in these situations. Two, capability. Perceived capability or confidence women may hold in their ability to lead. Women are less likely to advocate or promote themselves with less nominations for awards and less actively seeking a pay rise or career opportunities. For the women in our audience today, just have a think. How many times have you thought to us, thought to yourself, I don't really want to make a fuss about this. I just want to, you know, people will think I'm really up myself. The thought, does it just cross our minds or is it everyone? The third thing Dr. Teed brings up is credibility. The perceived traits that are consistent with leadership. There persists a bias in leadership and organizational culture, linking traditionally masculine styles, values to leadership credibility, which may reduce the motivation for women to actually seek or retain leadership positions. Women are often sort of um, covered as saying that we are very inclusive leaders. I think inclusive leadership has excellent styles, but masculine leadership styles maybe push us away from these sort of roles. So the key to remember is more work needs to be done. We need to keep credibility, capacity, as well as capability in mind, particularly if we are mentoring women to come into leadership roles. I came across an article that was published about two days ago. There was a survey done by the British Medical Association, which reported nine out of 10 female doctors in the UK have experienced sexism at work. The survey showed that 91% of female doctors have experienced sexism in the work environment. It was found that only about 4% of men felt that their clinical ability had been doubted or undervalued because of their gender, whereas 70% of women who responded in this survey said that they felt their clinical ability was undervalued because of their gender. I am quoting 2021 statistics. So the issue of perceived capability is a real issue for women and one that I have grappled with. An example comes to my mind when I was a registrar and I was interviewing for a, um, a, a, a position. So as I was a GP training to become a specialist general practitioner. And as a registrar, you have to go to certain practices and um, sit, sit for an interview, see if you're appropriate for the job. So we went through this interview with this gentleman who was interviewing me at this practice. And about 45 minutes, you know, sort of into, into the conversation, he noticed my ring on my, on my finger and he said, are you married? And I said, well, yes, yes, I am married. Then he said, do you have children? And I thought, goodness, I don't think this is an appropriate question for an interview. But nevertheless, I said, no, not at this point in time. The question that followed was, are you planning to have children? The response I said was, you know, we've got to sort of, you know, it's probably on the cards, but not at this point in time. And the response he gave me was, we really need to reconsider the employability for you, because if you are not going to be here, then I'm not terribly sure I can take you up as a registrar. Now, the last 45 minutes of that conversation suddenly become quite, quite redundant. But this has really stuck with me. This was in 2015. So it was not that long ago. These are the situations that we're all sort of sitting in. I'm not trying to say it's doom and gloom for everyone and all of us, but these are prevalent within our society, whether it's in the Western or Eastern society, it is always going to be there. And we need to wait, find ways to work our way around it. 2020 has placed us in quite a bit out of our comfort zone, tested our patients, not as in patients as in doctor patients, but our actual patients, questioned our capacity as a community. And for all the advances we have made from bubonic plague to smallpox to cholera to HIV to malaria, our growth to a certain extent has made us very vulnerable. When the virus first emerged in Wuhan in China, Racism against Chinese people also rose at the same time. This racism was directed towards doctors and other health professionals in hospitals who were of Chinese descent and Asian descent. Several patients of mine 
within the clinic have suffered discriminatory remarks that were made to them publicly or even to their children because of their ethnicity. It is at times like this that our unconscious bias plays a role in our attitudes and behaviors. We assume things because of our race, religion, gender, cultural differences. Ultimately, unconscious bias is going to be prevalent. They are social stereotypes in certain groups, and it is part and parcel of who we are as we are brought up. We all hold unconscious beliefs and biases. So do I. I do too. But often, we tend to have some of these biases so confounding in our thought process that it can be clouded and clouding our judgment. That's when it becomes a bit of an issue. There is an instance that I can share within my practice when a patient made a remark like this during a consultation with me. When they said, oh, you know, I point, they were talking about COVID-19 and how it emerged in Wuhan and it's all to do with, you know, the Asian population. And I said, well, COVID-19 is an infectious disease and it's not race dependent. The patient replied to me saying, it's because you're a woman, you're just too soft to fight this. I was actually being judged by my, for my gender, despite the fact that we were in a medical consultation. Gender also tends to influence the way in which seniority and clinical experience is perceived by patients and other doctors. Even if women demonstrate strength, ambition and resilience, our daily battles with microaggressions, especially the expectations and assumptions formed by stereotypes and racism, can push us down. Psychologist Pauline Rose Clans and Suzanne Imms in 1978 coined the term imposter phenomenon. They described this as despite outstanding academic and professional accomplishments, women who experience the imposter phenomenon persist in believing that they are not really not that bright and have, been, have fooled everyone else to think otherwise. This concept has taken quite a bit of traction, as many of you would already know, and it often seems the word imposter syndrome to me sounds like some sort of a diagnosis. It carries a very heavy weight, don't you think? Syndrome, especially that word syndrome implies some sort of hysteria in a woman from the 19th century. Imposter syndrome as a concept unfortunately sometimes fails to capture this dynamic and puts the onus on women to be able to deal with these effects. But the reality is we need to actually create culture for women and people of color that addresses systemic bias and racism. Only by doing so, we can actually reduce the experiences that accumulate the so-called imposter phenomenon, especially for women of marginalized communities. How often do you hear it? I often hear it. I hear it from myself as well. I'm not a leader, but I always wanted to say something that reveals that I can change my practice or I can change someone else. I want to change and improve the health for other people, change the community, change the way of thinking. You don't have to be the big L in the leadership. You can be the small L in leadership and actually carry out these tasks in your day-to-day -day community activities that we do. I am running short on time. So on my final note, I'd like to say my biggest, my biggest strength has been my mentors. Mentoring is an immensely powerful tool and it helps us break highly masculine leadership styles. Having excellent mentors can help normalize imposter feelings, empirically challenge our negative self-talk and deliberate and counteract stereotypical threat. The behavior we walk past is the behavior we accept. We need to challenge our own behaviors. It helps to foster growth and equality. I have been very blessed to have a family who have and continue to support me. They are my number one mentors, my parents and my husband. The reason I'm actually here talking is because of that. There are some other people that I would really like to mention. Dr. Steve Longworth is a GP and he was my supervisor. Prior to applying for some leadership positions, I've always consulted him to get his opinion and thoughts. And all he has ever said to me is, go for it, don't stop yourself. He said that multiple times to me, but that positive reinforcement 
really is an empowering tool. Mr. Kim Goddard is a general surgeon at Armadale Hospital here, an immensely powerful mentor that I really look up to. And Professor Janice Bell. Janice has played a big role in helping to shape my thought processes and also in also acting as a sounding board for many of the questions and challenges that I've faced. We need leaders who have combination of personal humility and willpower. We can apply this in a stepwise change to make bigger changes to all those leaders that we mentioned when we started off this webinar. We need leaders who can understand cooperative leadership and those who can lead from the front and know when to take a supportive role. And most importantly, we need leaders who look out the window and not into the mirror. I'd like to conclude this talk with a quote. And this quote would be quite familiar for many of you, but this is something that is very close to my heart. Do not always look for gratitude for sometimes when you're most deserving, you will get the least. There will be disappointments. Your pet theory will be dashed to the ground. Your most painstaking laborious work unsuccessful. There will be cares, anxieties, failures, which are very common to a professional life. Face trials with a smile, with head held erect and a calm exterior. If you are fighting for the right and for the true principle, be calm and sure and keep on until you win. This quote was written by Dr. Ida Scudder on graduation day address in 1922 to her very first batch of 14 medical students, all of which were women from below. Thank you so very much for your time.